Join me please in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28. In fact, it's right there on the screen. It's a short verse. It doesn't take long to read it. But it takes a little while to understand it. It takes a little while to meditate on what this verse is all about. Proverbs 22, verse 28 says this, Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. You know, there are a lot of boundaries in our everyday lives, aren't there? If you enjoy sports, you know that uh, there are inbounds and out-of-bounds. If you play golf, uh, if you get out of the fairway and out into the the area beyond the little stakes that are there, you're out of bounds and you're penalized for that. If you play basketball, if your foot hits that sideline or that end line, you're out of bounds. Same thing in, in uh, football. Baseball, you've got foul lines that go out there and if the ball lands on the outside of those foul lines, it's no good. It doesn't matter if it you know, went clear out of the park. It, it wasn't within the bounds. We have boundaries in our lives all the time. In business, we have boundaries. For example, if you are involved in accounting uh, or in finance, the Securities and Exchange Commission has uh, established boundaries for you. And they have determined what is right and what is wrong. And, you can do these things here financially, but you can't do these things over here. You can't do these things over here. They've established boundaries, and if you cross that boundary, you are guilty and you are in trouble. There are lots of boundaries in life. In our personal lives, you get into the car and you want to go somewhere, but you have to keep your car within the lines, don't you? There's the center line and there's the fog line and you need to stay in your lane of travel and you need to watch those pretty blinking lights and, and all the little signs along the road and if you don't, you end up in trouble. Maybe some really serious trouble. We have boundaries all over our lives. Now it's interesting in Psalm 32 where David is confessing his great sin with Bathsheba, he makes an interesting introduction to it. Let me just read it to you. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. It's a tremendous description of what we call sin in general. Okay? It says, Blessed is he whose transgression, that's one word, transgression is forgiven, whose sin, that's the second word, is covered, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. That's the third word. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. Transgression, sin, iniquity. A threefold description of what it means to violate the standards of God. The word transgression means to rebel in its root form. And from that, we get the idea of crossing a boundary. Going beyond an established limit. Because to go beyond the limit is a rebellion, isn't it? We, we always rebel against limits. So the idea of a transgression is to cross a boundary, to get into some area, to do something that otherwise has been forbidden. The word sin means to miss the mark, and the word iniquity refers to the defilement of soul. You put all three of those together, you've got a pretty good description of humanity, don't you? We are defiled in our souls, we miss the mark of God's standard, which is perfection, and we're constantly crossing the boundaries, getting out into areas of our lives where we are not supposed to be. We need those boundaries. We need those markers in our lives because it is within the boundary that we are safe. When we lived in Hollidaysburg, we had a fenced-in backyard, and our two dogs that we had at the time spent most of their time up next to the fence. <laughs> they were close to the boundary. 
as long as they stayed inside the fenced-in yard, they were perfectly safe. If they got out on the other side, it was quite likely that destruction would come. We see that in our society today, don't we? We see it in our own selves. We press up against the boundaries. We want to test the boundaries. But it's within the boundaries that there is safety and security. Now, back to Proverbs 22. The idea here is in the reference to fields and property and so forth, it was quite common in the ancient Near East to have boundary stones, boundary markers. They didn't have fences like we are accustomed to having today. But they did have piles of stones and markers that they could put at the corners of property and, and that would sort of eliminate any question about whose property it was. But if you were unscrupulous, you could go out in the dark of night, because they didn't have very many electric lights out there then, and you could quietly move those stones over about a foot. And maybe the next week you do another foot. And maybe the next month you move them over another foot. And, you know, it's, it's like those little drops of water that fall into a glass and you, you have there in the sink and maybe this faucet's leaking a little bit. And, and you think, oh, it's just one drop now and then. And so you leave it there and it keeps dropping and dripping and one by one by one by one you come back in the evening and you've got a whole little glass full of water. And you say, well, I had no idea. One little drop resulted in all of that being lost in our water system. Well, sin is the same way. When you move the boundaries a little bit, people may not notice at first. Things may not change a great deal. Somebody may observe it and say, oh, well, that's too bad. That, that shouldn't be happening. But we don't deal with it the way we should at the beginning. And before too long, we are flooded with sin. We are flooded with iniquity. We are awash in our transgression. And the judgment of God falls. Six times the Bible mentions the sin of moving boundary stones. We're not going to look at all of them. You can check them out this afternoon for yourself. Two of them are in Deuteronomy, one in Job. We looked at one in Proverbs already. You'll find another one in chapter 23, verse 10. And then in Hosea chapter 5. All of those places talk about the tremendous sin of moving boundary stones. Property and the possession of it and the retention of it is absolutely fundamental to civil life. One of the things that we early on declared in our national documents was that all men have the right, unalienable rights, to certain things. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And then, later on, we talk about, in, in our state laws and so forth, property rights. You need to have the right to be secure in your person and in your property. I don't have the right to come up and smack you in the head and take your wallet out of your pocket. That's a violation of rights. It's a violation of boundaries, and we recognize those things. Boundaries like these are essential to our civil society. God created boundaries. Gravity is a boundary. We all have to learn to live within it, don't we? If you step off the end of this platform, there's only one direction you're going to go, and it's down. Now, we try to do that in a controlled fashion, and so we have steps or whatever, um, but gravity is one of those boundaries that you cannot defy without serious consequence. We get in our airplanes and we take off, but it's the, the movement of air across the wing that creates lift and drag and all of those things, and if you're an aeronautical engineer, you understand all that stuff, and... and but gravity's still at work. 
you shut the engine off, and guess what? You're going to come down. They have a glide path, and all the airplanes have different kind of you know glide paths and so forth. And maybe they can land safely when the engine quits, but you know there are limits, and gravity eventually takes over, and down it comes to the earth with tragic consequences. We cannot get around this idea of boundaries, but we're trying, aren't we? We are trying to change things in our world. For example, we are trying to change our concept of humanity in its origin and in its nature. We've had the war with the origin for years. The evolutionists, these great scientists, have classified us, I hope you like this, as homo sapiens. Uh, we are wise men. Actually, we are Homo sapiens sapiens. That distinguishes us from other Homo sapien types. We're, we're the wiser of the wise. And why is that? Why do they? Well, let me just read a little definition here for us. This is a common one. If you've ever Googled a word definition, you've probably come across dictionary.com on the internet. And it gives us a fairly accurate look at what we as a society are thinking about word meanings. So here it is. Homo sapiens, the species of bipedal primates, you're a primate, did you know that? To which modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, belong. Characterized by a large brain, a nearly vertical forehead, a skeletal build lighter and teeth smaller than earlier humans, and dependence upon language and the creation and utilization of complex tools. The species has existed for about 200,000 years. We have assaulted the boundary that God has set on humanity. Genesis tells us that in the beginning, God created. And God created man in his own image. And he created mankind separate, distinct from all animal creation. We are not the product of a long evolutionary chain of chance that turned out something better than what it started with. It's just not true. We've been assaulting the origin of humanity for years. Now, it was in 1859 that Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species, and I don't remember the whole big long title of it, but it's, you know, like 25 words long. But that's when the assault really began to gain traction. It had been happening years before that. But today, the assault on what it means to be human is a little bit different. It has to do with the very nature of our humanity. Scripture says that God created the male and female. Science, so called, is trying to convince us that there is no such thing as male and female. You have a gender that's assigned at birth. Can't you picture it? Here's this little baby. It just arrived. And the doctor says, hmm, let's see. Oh, what shall I assign this one? Hmm. I don't know. Let's say unknown. We'll let the little baby figure it out later. Now you say, come on, Pastor, are you serious? That's the direction it's going. We have gender assigned at birth. We've even assaulted the nature of humans. We've been at this for a while. Humans, according to secularists, are basically good. We're smart. We have those big brains and straight foreheads. And, and, and we know how to make tools. And we're always looking to improve ourselves. So humans are basically good. 
There is no such thing as sin. It's all just a, a problem, a, a, a result of inadequacy or lack of something. They need more education. They need more money. They need more food. They need more whatever. And, and we just have to do those things, provide those things, give people those things, and then they'll be fine. You know, the reason people steal is because some folks have more than other people. So if we just make everybody the same, then everybody will be happy and we won't have theft anymore. Can you point to me at one moment in history where that idea is true? You can't. You can't. People are not basically good. But that's what the world wants us to believe. The world also wants us to believe that we're free to choose and discover our own reality. What's right for you? What's right for me? What's beneficial for you? What's beneficial for me? We can choose those things. And maybe for you, it's best to do something, live some way over here. Maybe for me, it's best to do something or live some, some way over there. But we can't impose these things on one another because we're all free to determine our own realities. Do you honestly believe that? Am I free to decide that I'm, I'm perfectly capable of driving on the left-hand side of the road? Would you want to be on the same road with me? Am I free to say, well, I don't have to look at those red lights and green lights. I can just go. Because after all, I'm special and I'm important. And it doesn't really matter what other people are doing or thinking. I'm just going to go. And if I run somebody over, well, after all, I'm free to do what I think is best. Do you really think we can live in that kind of an environment? But those are the things that are being pushed in modern society today. Join with me, please, in Romans chapter 1. Here's what happens when you begin to think that you can do whatever it is that you want to do and you don't have to pay attention to God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What are they doing? Why are they the recipients of God's wrath? What in the world is going on that has made God so angry at his creation? Good questions. Let's see what the answer is. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They're suppressing the truth. They're, they're trying to keep the truth, those self-evident truths, from being accepted and widely known and understood and most importantly, lived by. That's what they're doing. They're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. The Word of God, the written Word, which God has revealed to His prophets, to His apostles, He has given to mankind so that we might know Him. And the living Word, Jesus Christ, the Gospel of John says that Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth, we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. The one who is in the bosom of the Father, referring to Jesus Christ, He has explained the Father. That's why Jesus could say in response to Philip's question to show us the Father, Philip, have I been with you so long and yet you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God has revealed Himself to us in creation, in the written Word, and in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, second member of the Trinity. We've, we, we're, we're without excuse. 
Verse 20, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Wow. We are trying to move the boundary stones in tremendous, tremendous ways in the times in which we live. Why does that happen? Why? How is it that it's happening so easily? Have you noticed how fast things have changed in the last year and a half or two years? It makes your head spin, doesn't it? I mean, we, we have seen the world radically change its behavior, its mindset, in the last two years more than I think in the previous 20 or 30. People are, are listening, they are bowing down, they are, they are swallowing down what's being told them in the public media like never before. And without question. How does that happen? Well, I think it is the result of the basic desire of humanity in our fallen condition. We want to suppress the truth. We don't want the truth. We want to live according to our own version of reality. In other words, our own lies to ourselves. We want to be deceived. We don't want God. We don't want the truth. It's just, it's, it's just amazing. And we think we have enough wisdom to solve our own problems. We can't deny that there are problems in the world. But we think we're smart enough to solve them. We're just going to throw more money at them. We're going to pass a government program. We're going to look to science. We're going to look to medicine. We're going to look to economics. We're going to look to all these things and we're going to bow down at those temples and we're going to say, save us from destruction. The problem is, we're bowing down to fellow human beings and we're appealing to them to save us and they are in the same cooking pot that we're in. How can they save us? We refuse to look to God. We refuse. We're going to solve these problems ourselves. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Satan comes to Eve and to Adam there in the garden in the form of a serpent. And he starts out with a question. Did God really say... Now, we have recently left a denomination that loved to ask that question. Does the Bible really say this or that? Is it really there? Maybe can we interpret it a little differently? Can we come up with a different plan? Is there any way that we can overthrow that old understanding because after all, we're looking for something new? But beloved, that's not a recent problem. That's just simply that same old tactic of the evil one to cause people to question the truth. When you and I were growing up, we did have to learn a few things the hard way, didn't we? You know, I mean, mom and dad would say, or grandma and grandpa would say, don't do this. And we would have to test that out a little bit. At least I did. And I know that the Board of Education was applied to the seat of learning more than once. And I'm here to tell the tale, and I'm not scarred. You know? It's okay to bring discipline. Discipline is important. Correction, training, and righteousness. That's all important. The problem is... You just keep asking that question and keep asking that question and keep questioning and questioning and questioning. 
Remember, you know, in the 1960s, the mantra was question everything and don't believe authority. Well, we're still there. We're still questioning everything. Uh, I mean, you, you turn on the media today and you, you hear one group saying one thing and another group saying the complete opposite and both of them are declaring that their statements are true. And you know, How can you sort all that stuff out? That's an old tactic of Satan. Question everything. Question everything. Do we need to maintain these old boundaries, these old fuddy-duddy ideas of right and wrong? I mean, haven't we grown past that already? The next thing that Satan did there in the Garden of Eden was to just simply deny God's Word. Once he got Adam and Eve to question it, then he could simply say, you will not surely die. You can get by with it. You can, you can do what you've been told not to do and the consequences that you have been told will follow will not follow. Didn't God say to Adam, you're free to eat from every tree in the garden except from the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. It's in the present tense, and its fullest translation would be this. You're going to start to die at that moment, and you're going to continue to die on and on and on until you're dead. We think that, you know, it means you're going to take a bite of that fruit, and bang, you're going to drop over, and that's the end of it. No. But the ultimate consequence had its root in that moment. Have you ever done something that you knew was wrong and you got away with it for a while? The consequence did not immediately, instantaneously fall upon your head, but later it caught up. Sure, I've been there. We all have. The consequences aren't going to happen though. See, you're the exception and we are deceived by that. You will not surely die. And then Satan offers a substitute. He says, you will know good and evil. You will be like God. And that's exactly what our world is doing today. We don't have to listen to God. Maybe God didn't really say that. Maybe we're free to interpret it any way we want. Maybe let's look at all the cultures of the world and they've all got some kind of religion. So really, you know, all roads lead to the same place or religion is just made up by the elite so that they can control the masses. Well, whatever the excuse is, let's throw that whole thing out there's not going to be any consequence to this and we're going to be the exception and we're going to come up with something far, far better. We're going to solve our own problems. We're even going to live forever. Wow. You say, Pastor Roger, seriously, do you think people are, are trying to live forever? Oh, absolutely. Why do you think all this genetic research is going on? so that we can eliminate death. We can eliminate aging. We can eliminate all those boundaries that God has set. Now, we can manipulate them. We can change them. We can cross the boundaries with no negative consequences whatsoever. Beloved, that's the society that we live in. Is there any hope? I mean, are we past that point of no return? I think there is a point of no return. I think there is a point when mankind will so violate the boundaries of God that God will say, just like He said in the days of Noah, that's enough. And judgment will come. I don't know when that point is, but I know this. God is willing to respond 
to the repentant hearts of his people. And I think we need to understand that the judgment of God is not coming so much because of the unbeliever out there. I think we're experiencing it because those who know Christ, who claim to know Him, have become so much like the world, there's hardly any difference. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus says, You be holy, even as your Father in heaven is holy. Are we holy people? Are we distinct from the society in which we live? We're, we're, we're living in this society, but do we behave like the society? Do we believe like the society? Do we follow the society's directions and goals and purposes? Do we just get, go along to get along? Is that how it works? Is that what God wants us to be? Or has He called us to be salt which preserves from corruption and light which exposes the darkness and exposes the sinfulness? I think He's called us to be salt and light. And yet so many times we just are silent and dark and the world doesn't see any difference. So beloved, the reason that you and I in this nation are in the situation that we are in is because we have largely failed as God's representatives in this world. We've thought all along that God is here to make our lives nice. We can have nice children who grow up to have nice marriages, who grow up to have nice children and nice jobs and uh, nice families and, and they can have a nice retirement and then they can die and go to be with the Lord and everything after that will be nice. We are here to be God's representatives. We are engaged in a spiritual battle. We are engaged as God's <coughs> warriors, if you will. But it's not a weapon of, of flesh. It's not a, a weapon that we see. Our greatest weapon is prayer. The Word of God. The truth. To be living it. To be proclaiming it. And the amazing thing is, when we do that, and we try to do that consistently, God honors that, and God drives away spiritual darkness. People get saved, and their lives are transformed. And they begin to discover who they are in Christ and what God has delivered them from. And it's out of that abundant love and appreciation and gratitude to God for His unmerited grace, that then they go out and they share that good news with others. <clears throat> That's the solution to our problems today. Whatever nation we happen to live in. The United States, Russia, China, North Korea. When people turn to God, God transforms lives. And as He transforms lives, He transforms nations. So as we come to a close, we're going to return to prayer. We're going to ask God to search our own hearts first and to see where we've crossed the boundaries. And ask Him to forgive us and to help us learn how to live within the boundaries because it's inside the boundaries that we have safety. It's inside the boundaries that we have joy. It's inside God's boundaries that we can find peace and strength. That we can mount up with wings like eagles. That we can run and not be weary. And we can walk and not faint. And then we're going to ask God to send us out into this world. To be the salt and light that He wants us to be. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, you <coughs> brought this nation into being, and you blessed it abundantly in its beginning. And it was not because of any greatness on the part of our founding fathers. It was for your glory. And Father, for a long time, this nation did indeed acknowledge you. Your church was strong. Pastors from all denominations believed that the Word of God was the very Word of God. And they preached it as such. And people turned to you and they believed what your Word said. And they structured a society based on truth personal responsibility, living a righteous life. But Father, in most recent years, all of those things have been set aside. And we, your people, have been complicit in that. We've been silent when we should have spoken up. We have learned to turn to the political machine trying to accomplish through that what can really only be accomplished through prayer and humility and intercession before you. We've thought that if we can get the right person elected, then our problems would be over. And justice and righteousness would prevail. And yet, Father, every time that we've seen that supposed right person elected, we've also seen our society continue to slide, continue to fall away from your word. Maybe it got slowed for a little bit, but it continues to plummet. Father, forgive us for being so much a part of this world that we've forgotten that we're engaged in a spiritual battle. That our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realms. Help us, Father, to take up those spiritual weapons that you have provided for us. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Father, forgive us, your children, for failing to pray for our leaders. Forgive us, your children, for not standing for righteousness even in our own lives. We have indulged our own sin instead of forsaking them. Father, you are a God of mercy. You are a God who delights in forgiving. And that's why you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into this world to save sinners. That's why we have hope. That's why we can cry out to you this morning, because we are the recipients of your salvation. So, Father, we pray that you would bring revival to our own hearts and stir us up that we might live lives of holiness, lives within the boundaries of your word. Help us to be the salt and the light that you want us to be in these days. Lord, it's not by accident that we are alive today. You have brought us to this place for just such a time as this. Help us, Lord Jesus, to lay aside the sin and all the stuff that just so easily entangles us. And help us, Lord, to run the race that you have set before us. Help us to be holy in our thoughts, in our actions. Help us to share the good news of Christ with those around us. Whether the world takes notice, whether they follow us, whether they persecute us, Father, help us to be firmly fixed on Christ our Savior and to run to Him 
doing the work that he's called us to do. Father, we thank you for the heritage which is ours. And we pray, Lord, that you would stir up your people. That we would see this nation experience repentance and revival. That there would be millions, millions and millions who are involved in dead, lifeless churches today, that they would turn to Jesus Christ. Most of them need to be saved. Some of them need to wake up and repent and be revived. Lord, you know the hearts. But may your church respond to you this day. And Father, may those who are in darkness, our friends, our family members, Maybe our parents, our children, grandchildren. Father, may they see Jesus Christ and Him crucified for their sins. And may they turn to Him for salvation. Lord, this is a spiritual battle. I pray that we will not lose. I pray that we will be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And that you will be glorified. We ask it in your precious name. Amen.